Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guests are Jeffrey Smythe, CEO of Hope Atlanta, Teresa Wessel, Executive Director of Horizon House in Indiana, and Ralph Boyd, President and CEO of Some, So Others Might Eat in Washington, D.C. We're going to talk about homelessness and, and the issues surrounding homelessness. So thank you, panel, for joining us, and a reminder to our webinar guests, that you can ask questions to the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen, and we do encourage you to do that, and we'll try to cover those topics during the show. So it's so great to talk about this very serious issue that is becoming accentuated, particularly at this time of COVID-19, and also the fact that none of us are immunized from the effects of homelessness in our cities. You see this in no instance more clearly than, than in a pandemic where health disparities um, of one community uh, are not uh, kept away from uh, members of another community. Uh, so let's, let's talk a little bit about your work and let's start off with you, Jeff, and then we'll go around the table. Um, and, and if you can give us a sense of the state of affairs in Atlanta, um, that would be great. Then, we could, then we'll, we'll, we'll hopscotch around the country. Sure, uh, yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, and thank you for having me and uh, for helping uh, Hope Atlanta and, and our fellow nonprofits um, have more of a spotlight, particularly with the really important populations that we're serving. Um, Atlanta has uh, responded quickly um, and, and as comprehensively as, as possible as I'm seeing comparatively around the country um, throughout the crisis. Um, our organization in particular uh, usually serves about 8,000 individuals a year. Um, throughout the 23 to 28 county area that we uh, touch throughout the year. And uh, really, uh, thankfully, we were able to react quickly. Our street outreach teams were able to pivot to be more uh, education, uh, questionnaire screening, and food distribution. Um, so we were able to get out and I believe uh, catch a lot of education uh, needs ahead of time. So thankfully, I, our numbers have been a little bit lower than some of our fellow cities around the nation. Um, but we've, and we follow that up with being able to move roughly uh, 300 to 400 individuals into different emergency hotel situations. Um, not only city of Atlanta, but some of the surrounding suburban counties have done a lot of hotel work. And we've been heavily involved with that. Um, one of the benefits during this crisis for us has been our street outreach team that was actually covering the airport every night. We were experiencing upwards of 200 to 300 individuals hitting the airport every night for shelter. Um, we've been able to move a good number of those, particularly the most vulnerable, the older adults, into um, health hotel settings, emergency hotel settings, and are, are working very quickly, diligently on housing plans. So uh, a lot going on there. Of course, we've also um, tried to ramp up a lot more on the rental assistance and eviction prevention side of things. Um, so uh, we, we uh, kind of invited the, the entire city to uh, raise their individuals and families to raise their hands if they were in need. Um, and we quickly, as you can imagine, became overwhelmed with a, a list that's longer than we're gonna be able to help. Uh, but we, uh, we did that because we wanted to at least make sure that we were covering more than, more than just city center, that we were getting out um, into our broader service area and making sure that we're helping families all over uh, the metro area. So those are a few of the things that we've been up to in terms of our COVID-19 um, response. You're raising a whole series of points, very, very important. First of all, that the need is far greater than uh, than all of those that you've served, far greater. It's, it, it's a multiple, multiplier of that. Secondly, you raise the issue of invisibility because people are homeless in addition to the shame that attaches to being homeless, um, the, um, the uh, issue of wanting to be invisible so that you're not harassed, um, the issue of constantly needing to be on the move, um, and because it's so invisible, you, you have to have staff who are savvy and track people down. And then you also raise the issue of food security, of 
of getting information so that you can keep yourself healthy, of providing health care, of education for, for young people, because among the homeless are children, um, and the different uh, uh, care needs of different populations. Mm -hmm. And then the whole issue of how civil society at large is affected, whether it's uh, travel and, and airports or parks or, or other places, uh, the whole issue of the vulnerability of people who are homelessness trying to cluster in communities with very little protection. Uh, those issues are, are endemic throughout America and we don't pay attention, do we, Teresa? Um, thanks, Mark. No, I, I totally agree. And, and a lot of the same things that Jeff spoke about, we're doing here in Indianapolis as well. Um, just to, to piggyback on the, the street outreach, because that is something that's so critical here in Indianapolis. We have something that we call the Professional Blended Street Outreach that we coordinate. And it is about 50 individuals uh, from 20 different organizations that are out on the street six days a week and two nights. And during this pandemic, um, we, Horizon House, actually deployed about six more of our staff to go out on street outreach. And we're seeing about, right now, 200 to 225 a day um, since this has started, so since the middle of March. And really, our focus was around the, uh, the food insecurities as well as the, the isolation and the education and information. So we were in a, a unique position in that our city, uh, the mayor's office, the Office of Public Health and Safety, actually provided all of the food, the water, hand sanitizers, gloves, masks, the thermometers, et cetera, for the, the outreach teams to actually go out. And so they provided that for about 13 weeks uh, where we were the central point and making sure that people were not going without food because when the city was shut down, they really had no place to go to get food. So, so many of the, the neighbors, as we call our clients, would tell us we were the only folks that they were seeing for, for food. Um, so that's one of the things. We're an actual uh, day center, and so we did not close our doors. We modified our services to be able to uh, adhere to social distancing, do all the screening tests, et cetera. But folks can get their mail delivered here. So you can imagine how important it is to be able to still get your mail. So we really had a walkthrough service. Folks come in, get their mail, uh, get hygiene products, socks, underwear, and then a food kit to go. So uh, we just opened back up last week. So now we're offering showers, case management services, employment services, and then next week we'll open back up for laundry. So we see about 6,000 people a year and actually our numbers are up. Um, so even without the, the wave of, of evictions that we are so fearful that are going to happen here later this summer, uh, our numbers are up already 9% so far this year. Uh, so even through this pandemic, we are still seeing more people and we think those numbers are going to continue to increase over time. We also have a, a permanent supportive housing uh, team that we have about 200 people that are housed that even though they're housed, they were still feeling that same isolation, that fear of unknown and that anxiety. So we changed to, you know, tele, you know, doing telemeetings, but, but I think that even though those folks are housed in permanent supportive housing, that anxiety and that fear still resonated with them. And you can go from city to city to city um, suburban areas, rural areas, homelessness is spread across the United States as if it was smooth peanut butter, right? It's, it's, it's all over the place and it's all over the place in equal proportions in uh, towns like Indianapolis, in places like Atlanta. DC is only, well, it's less than 70 square miles. And you have a, a very significant issue. It's our nation's capital. It's where the seat of government is. You would think that at least in DC, that there was uh, more help. And those people who are living with homelessness are depending on nonprofits like, like yours, Ralph. Talk a little bit about what you're confronting. Yeah, Mark, you're absolutely right. I think, um, one of the realities uh, that we're coming to grips with as the nation as a whole deals with what I'll describe as our twin crises of COVID-19, along with the very visible issues of racial inequity um, and injustice, um, we're realizing as a nation 
um, for some people, perhaps for the first time, are reflecting and introspecting about it in ways they never have before. But it's very clear that these twin crises disparately impact the poor and, and the homeless and those who are at risk of becoming homeless and black and brown people who are disproportionately represented in those, in the, in those groups. And so um, it's interesting that in the district here and surrounding communities, we just had released just this past week our homelessness numbers. And the number for uh, the District of Columbia was about 7,000. And for the greater national capital region, it was somewhere between uh, 10 and 11,000. Those are serious and significant numbers, especially when we're talking about not just our nation's capital, but essentially the world's capital, if you will, to have those kinds of numbers. But we think those numbers actually underrepresent the scale of the real problem because they don't capture those people who are at risk of becoming homeless and, and almost certainly will at some point during the next 18 to 24 months. And it doesn't capture the scale of people who are in great need, who may not be homeless or at risk of it, but are in great need. So um, in, in the District of Columbia, and you alluded to this in your comments, uh, and, and Teresa uh, and Jeff have, have, have touched on it as well. Um, the issue of homelessness, homelessness is really exacerbated in our cities by the compression of our affordable housing stock. There simply isn't enough housing for people who need it at a cost point, at a price point they can afford. It's attributable to a lot of things, to gentrification, to the cost of market rate housing, to the fact that the generations coming along don't gravitate towards single family home ownership the way prior generations do. So they're, they're filling that space of, of market rate, um, multifamily rental housing, which compresses the availability of of affordable housing stock. So all of those issues are conspiring to create a real issue of people not being able to live in our cities uh, in a way that's dignified, safe, and stable. Give you some sense of a metric about this. Uh, in the District of Columbia, if you're a single person uh, and you wanna afford a market rate uh, rental housing uh, and you make the minimum wage, you'd have to you'd have to work somewhere between 90 and 100 hours a week to be able to afford it. Obviously, that, that, that's not sustainable. It's not, it's not a workable position. So what are we doing and what are our other partners in the nonprofit sector doing with our, with our, uh, our, our social investors from the business world and government? So uh, we're, we're trying to respond to, to uh, create situations where we can add to the affordable housing stock and Frankly, this crisis may afford us an opportunity to do that as there's more investment in housing uh, production trust funds on the government side. There is um, capital that's flowing in that, that we hope to be able to take advantage of that'll help us construct and, and rehab more housing uh, for those who are at risk of housing, uh, of homelessness. And then there's the, we, we've all talked about it is the food insecurity issues. For example, we run, uh, food pantries here as well as have a, an affordable housing stock. We run medical, dental, mental health clinics, job training and all of that. But our food pantries are experiencing a 600% increase in demand. Uh, so it tells you that this crisis has created an issue, not just of homelessness, but of hunger as well. And so there is so much that's going on in the district, um, but no matter what we do, we're not anywhere close to where we need to be. And I see everybody, everybody nodding. It seems that we also have this issue of income disparity, which accentuates this. Um, we, we have had this trend in the United States um, of, of moving toward what's mine is mine and uh, devil take the hindmost. And uh, that uh, uh, advantages people who are educated, people who are already wealthy, people who already have resources that they can invest to, to uh, continue that trajectory. There's, there's, nothing, um, there's nothing wrong with that in theory, but in fact, what ends up happening is that the people who, who are required to run these cities, who need to live within commuting distance to work in these cities, can no longer live in, the, in these cities. So you end up with people with means 
um, having uh, these, these magnificent uh, cities to live in and the people who make them run are always on the cusp. And what's happened with the coronavirus and with unemployment and so on, we have huge swaths of the population tipping into insolvency. So now we have these magnificent cities with huge insolvent populations who are thrown into homelessness and thrown into distress. And it's going to get worse because as, as we've seen in the news, we're, we have a lot of people who have had to skip their rents uh, recently. Uh, there are people who are out of jobs in, in other ways. Um, how do you all see us dealing with this systemically? Because uh, trying to shift affordable housing stocks, we're, we're working at the margins. Trying to provide food for today, it's absolutely important for survival, but we're working at the margins. Healthcare, we're working at the margins. Do you all see a way that we can work our way toward a, a systemic reduction in this issue? Um, and and uh, you know, anybody can jump in. Let's, let's again start with Jeff, but, but please just um, jump in if you have a point. Well, sure. I mean, I think, I think what we have been looking at is a systems approach that systems um, have gotten us here. Uh, and how do we then also go upstream to say, how do systems get, systems get us out of this? How do systems get us to solutions? Um, you mentioned healthcare. Uh, we have tried to be much more a part of healthcare conversations. There's a, uh, a collective impact group in our, our city with a number of hospitals uh, that we've tried to be more present with and involved with to have those important discussions around the connection between health and housing. Uh, we've been talking uh, more on criminal justice side of things and how systems there are uh, not favorable to individuals born into poverty, living in poverty, individuals seeking to um, uh, emerge from homelessness. Uh, we've, uh, uh, of course, you know, Ralph hit, hit the nail on the head. We've got to look at how our policies have uh, actually made racial injustice worse and made equity and opportunity harder. Um, it shouldn't be that if I'm born inside the city of Atlanta in poverty, that I have a 4% chance of uh, getting out of that um, and advancing. We, we've got to have, and we as, as nonprofits, I, I think we've been so focused on meet the need, meet the need. Uh, our overhead is so low, our staff is so stretched and spread out, particularly during crisis that we've not given ourselves that chance to say, how do we advocate? How do we push? How do we help our clients have a voice? So we're, what, what we're trying to do, and we're, what, we're, we're behind the eight ball, um, is to really push more advocacy, push more uh, having a voice, helping our clients have a voice, and pushing their voice forward. Uh, we, we just have a responsibility. There's, we, can't, we can't just be focused on trying to meet needs. That's not working in terms of a system, systematic solution. So we're trying to look upstream as, as has been mentioned. Is part of this just talking to each other? Like all of us talking to each other, uh, Teresa, Ralph, um, you know, I mean, part of this is we should be having these discussions every day. They should go on, on the, the, the main media channels. We shouldn't be focusing on uh, it, it's not that, that the voice isn't a great show and, and uh, you know, the, the uh, whatever the reality TV thing of the moment is aren't, aren't wonderful. Um, you know, sports playing to empty stadiums um, has definitely a, a role. But we should all be talking about this stuff. We should all be really engaged in trying to figure it out. So, Mark, I, I agree with the, that, that we should have conversation but I think it should be thoughtful conversation directed at creating some outcomes that move the ball forward. And I think the conversation has multiple aspects to it. And Jeff alluded to this. And, and I would, it, it's certainly more than the three that I see, but the three obvious points of conversation, I think, are what is, what is the blocking and tackling that we need to be doing and the resources to support that blocking and tackling that will move people, vulnerable individuals and families from a position of insufficiency and need to, to sufficiency 
and ultimately to prosperity because that's what we all aspire to. And when I say prosperity, I mean not just material prosperity, but emotional and spiritual prosperity as well. So one is what's the blocking and tackling that we need to do to give people the tools they need to be successful. The second piece of that is the impact that infrastructure has on all this. How are we building our cities and our communities and the infrastructure of them, the transportation model, the housing model, so that people, as you said, who are actually doing the work of running cities can afford to live in them or at least get to them if they live proximately to them. And then the third piece Jeff, Jeff talked about is, is the, and you talked about Mark, is the, is the policy piece. What is the proper and, and highest and best use, most efficient use of government and its resources to make these things happen? And then how do we, how do we deploy them effectively and efficiently? So I think it's, it's uh, those are three things that are obvious to me. I'm sure there are more things, but that's what we have to be talking about if we move from thoughtful conversation to uh, strategic solutions and then the execution and implementation of those solutions. And it seems also that each of these communities are very, um, are very philanthropic, but also very caring. It, it just seems that the caring is not scaled to the need today. And I think we have to look at ourselves, don't we, Teresa? Yes, and, and I think that um, I you know, obviously agree with what both Ralph and, and, and Jeff have said. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're very fortunate in Indianapolis is to have the Lilly Endowment here in our community. And through this pandemic, they have pumped in, they're probably close to $50 million in, in a lot of the different sectors. Um, but we have revamped our continuum of care to really focus on how we are moving the needle. We've got a reentry coalition. So now we've got plans working with DOC to actually start going into the, the, the jails um, 30 days prior to someone being released to ensure that they have housing on their way out. So there are a lot of those, I'll say, um, organic discussions that are happening, but the collaboration is increasing, whether it's around domestic violence, whether it's around HIV AIDS, whether it's, um, you know, someone, whether, you know, talk about the racism and, and the, the injustice there, right? So one of the things that we're really working on closely here is, you know, what piece of the pie do each of us have? So instead of every one of us trying to spread so thin, what are we going to focus on? So let's say we might be the, the best in permanent supportive housing. There's another agency that is the best in rapid rehousing. So I think the approach that we're taking in Indianapolis is starting to shift that and having um, this administration, uh, Mayor Hogsett here, he has now put so much money behind this. We've never seen an administration do that. And the Indianapolis Housing Agency is, is now on board. So I think having a lot of these other entities now are bringing this to the forefront, right? So our community is getting the education on the complexities of the issue of homelessness and what we need to do to come together to solve that. And then obviously prevention is now a huge piece for uh, several of the agencies here in Indianapolis. So I think when we, we talk, start talking about the root causes, how do we break that generational poverty and so United Way, we're, we're working on a two-gen project with them to really try and break that cycle. So we're coming at it from many different aspects and we're starting to see that needle move, even if it's in a small way, but it's moving in that direction. And those conversations are so critical. Mark, if I, I may, I have a, I, I'd like to make a comment with respect to what Teresa just said and that, then ask my colleagues a question that I, that I has percolated up as I've been listening. So Teresa, it's, a, it's interesting that you say what you said about collaboration amongst nonprofits and service providers, focusing on who's best suited to do what, um, you know, as, as opposed to everybody or, or, or many organizations replicating space. It's like, where's your highest and best use? And, and you focus on that and then we'll focus on this. So we cr create scale and efficiencies uh, in delivering those services. I had that very conversation this morning with one of our major uh, corporate social investors was focused on that very topic. So I think we're all seeing that 
there are resources that are out there that are willing to be deployed, but they want to be deployed in an efficient, scalable, effective way. So I'm glad you guys are having that conversation too, because I just had it this morning. My question for Teresa and, and Jeff is, we've been pleasantly surprised um, here with some in, in the District of Columbia um, at the degree to which, I'll just call everybody a social investor as opposed to a donor, because when you say donor, it's, it, it sounds like a gift and they don't have any expectation that's attached to it. But I view the folks who support us as investors with an expectation that we're going to take that dollar and, 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 and create all kinds of human gain at a scaled, leveraged way. Um, but ours, ours are really stepping to the plate. Everything from our $25 donors up to the folks who have the capacity to, to invest a million dollars in us are stepping to the plate. We've lost certainly some business uh, social investors that in the obvious lines of business that are struggling these days, but it's been more than made up so far by the other folks and particularly the folks in the 25 to $500 range. Are you all experiencing the same thing or are, are you having a different experience? Yes, we're, we're experiencing that same issue. And I just had that conversation with my, my board this morning in that, you know, I've been here 10 years at Horizon House and never at the month of May were we ahead of our, our, our budget, if you will, in the individual corporate and uh, organization giving. So um, the community has opened up. Uh, one of the concerns that we're talking about is, you know, how long will that last? Um, because obviously, as, as we get going through the year, if there's a, a second outbreak, you know, do we start getting then that donor fatigue? And will those the generosity of our investors, as you said, Ralph, will that start to slow down? So right now we are seeing the, the highest that we've seen in, in years past. But my, my question is, what's the, the, the momentum and how long will that continue? Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. We're, we're hopeful, uh, Teresa, that that momentum is not short-lived. <laughs> we're kind of uh, budgeting as though it's not gonna be short-lived. But certainly we have, uh, as you both have, been very, been just, you know, overwhelmed with um, gr gratitude for those who have reached out. Um, and we, what, what, what that pushed us to do is to kind of seize the day and say, how do we, how do we do some, how do we kind of package what we do in a way that, that the community can get a little bit more involved with? We're so government dependent and as government has asked us to do more with the CARES Act, that that tends to leave out the community and donors and, as you said, social investors. So, so we're trying something um, called 100 Days of Hope uh, coming up um, in, the, in the next three plus months to see if we can't really get people involved around veterans issues and uh, equity issues and uh, family issues and, and just having different pushes throughout those 100 days um, to get folks more charged up around who we're serving and how we're serving. That, that's good to hear. And I would just say, I and I said this at the beginning, I've been trying to take the twin crises and say to people who are asking themselves, what can they do? One of the things they can do concretely is support our work because our work speaks to those issues in a very direct ground level way. I think that that, uh, that is a great point to end on. Um, this, this whole idea that we as a country and each individual in the country uh, need to really give some deep consideration, uh, not to our own self-interest, but to the country's interest. Uh, Kennedy and other uh, of, the, uh, of the presidents who uh, led the country through very difficult times, whether it was uh, Roosevelt, or, um, or uh, uh, Reagan from any party. Um, they always asked us to think about the country, to think about strengthening America. Let's each individual uh, think about that question. What can we do? Uh, what must we contribute in order to end up with a stronger America? And so thank you all for making your contributions. Thank your staff, thank your investors your social investors, thank your constituents who are also working along beside you 
um, and helping you uh, in, in their way uh, to deal with these problems. Uh, that's the nonprofit report. Thank you attendees for uh, being part of the show. And uh, we will pick it up next time with another discussion on how to strengthen civil society here in this country. Stay safe, everyone. And thank you, panelists, for participating. <laughs>